Uh, so firstly, hello everybody. My name is Adil and I will uh, again be your moderator for the webinar today. Uh, we'd like to welcome everybody to uh, this really interesting webinar today and we'll get to our topic in a bit, just a couple of housekeeping items. Again, sort of the standard uh, plug to our conference that we'll be having uh, in Vancouver, uh, May 16th to the 18th of this year. Uh, so please, if you haven't booked your tickets, registration, please look at the CMBS website for all the conference uh, details that we're uh, planning. It'll be our first in-person conference after uh, for uh, for three years. Last one was 2019. Um, so today, the webinar, it will, for in terms of questions, we'll be uh, accepting typed questions. We may have some breaks in the middle for questions. Uh, but once again, please type your questions in into the Q&A. Uh, functionality that we have here, and Michael and I will be reading those questions out. Um, and lastly, the webinar will be recorded, and it will be made available after the afterwards on our YouTube channel. So please look at our YouTube channel for this webinar, our previous webinars, and all and all uh, sort of different content that we have available for you guys. Um, so firstly, talking about um, this topic, uh, the topic today it relates to cybersecurity, and I know that's always been a uh, interesting topic that has garners a lot of discussion. So today we'll be having it at, at, from a different lens. Um, so government agencies and Congress are actually increasing their focus on digital risks that impact the public healthcare sector in the United States. So today our topic is a more governed from our uh, more directed from the, from the United States government. Um, late last year, the White House announced their intention to release security directives targeting healthcare IoT devices. From the Center of Medicare and Medicaid, uh, the Joint Commission, which is sort of the equivalent, uh, a lesser equivalent of Accreditation Canada, has begun to construct a new audit for the cybersecurity of connected devices. And Congress has passed a high tech amendment offering financial protection and relief from costs associated with breaches. So the question is how can healthcare organizations take meaningful steps to prepare for these changes? And our expert speaker will discuss this topic today. And to introduce him, I'll ask Michael if you can please introduce our expert speaker. Excellent. Thanks, Adil. Yeah, this is we're really excited to have uh, Ty Greenlaw with us today. Um, he's um, uh, <clears throat> if you'll notice in our CMBS webinar series, and we're very happy that uh, all of our CMBS audience and beyond are able to uh, join us today. Um, we're really happy that Ty can present to us today because he's giving us not only a perspective in a series of, um, of webinars all on cybersecurity from many different angles. So today he's going to give us a, a little bit of a viewpoint from uh, one of the vendor products that we can consider, uh, but also as the deal was just pointing out, <clears throat> He can. He's also going to give an aspect of how they're looking at it down in the states from uh, a legislative um, kind of a, a lens. So he's going to give us a very, very rich lens. So as we chatted yesterday, I'll give a little sound bite. But uh, I think Ty, uh, given his experience in uh, presentations, etc., he's pretty. He's pretty good at uh, as at introducing himself. But I will point out that Ty is uh, industry principal for healthcare with uh, Medigate. Uh, by Clarity, and he's over 30 years experience in introducing, as he calls it, uh, disruptive technologies to improve healthcare uh, information management. And I think that's why we actually are most interested in this, because we've been hearing various different flavors of, um, uh, it's called EHR, EMR, um, it's, it's called so many different things, and it's been promised slash threatened for so many decades that um, we still have it in the back of our mind that at one point they're going to be connecting, they're going to be networking our ventilators and such and very dear devices. So um, with that, I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to Ty so he can uh, give us possibly some, a uh, little bit of um, assu assuage some of our fears um, by saying there are products out there that will allow for the protection and tracking of uh, things that are trying to connect to your medical devices. So very welcome, Ty. Um, and again, just to uh, reinforce what Adil was saying, I will monitor the little Q&A box. So type your questions into the Q&A um, and at the end or possibly during when Ty uh, wishes the break, um, we can read those questions out and, and have them answered. So with that, Ty, without further ado, I turn the floor to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Michael and Adil. This is uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you very much for having me. And 
uh, yeah, it's um, it is a, it is a scary world out there, and uh, when you start thinking about our medical devices or building management systems being uh, hacked by the bad guys uh, and potentially impacting patient care uh, or you know worse you know a region of a critical infrastructure it's uh it's a it's a scary thing i mean the faa uh, here in the united states uh, was disrupted across the whole united states the danish banking industry was just disrupted through a, a ddos attack and uh the uk mail system was just taken down that was just last week uh so there's you know there's 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 reasons to be concerned and uh so I, I ended up here in this particular industry um, because I guess Wayne Gretzky said, skate to where the puck is going to be. And, and that, that's why I'm here. I think that uh, there's a lot we can do here to, uh, to protect the, the healthcare industry on a whole. Uh, and, and it really doesn't matter which country you're in. It's the same medical devices. It's the same networking architecture. It's the same vulnerabilities. And it's the same bad guys. Uh, so with what I'm going to share today uh, really is understanding the problem, you know, where we came from, what the problem is, and what the opportunities are. So um, as Michael was saying, you know, been 30, been 30 years in the industry. Uh, I, I'm uh, a part of the health and public health care sector coordinating council in the health industry, healthcare industry. Uh, coordinating different government agencies and communication, but also uh, part of the 405D group, which uh, we'll get a little bit more into later. They gave me the ambassador title. My mother would be so proud. Uh, her son, the ambassador, right? Huh. So what we're going to do uh, as far as an agenda, we're going to say uh, a quick backstory and why hackers love healthcare. What is a wicked problem? Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, best practices. We're going to spend a little bit of time on that, probably majority, um, and understanding, you know, what can be done and why isn't it being done, and then what the new opportunities are, plus an unexpected business value uh, that comes out of this new technology. So the quick backstory, uh, from from uh, the the U.S. perspective, anyway is that uh, we, we came out with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act that uh, basically said, the government saying to uh, the private sector, you, you need to put in an EMR. And if you don't, we're gonna penalize you. And if you do, we're gonna reward you. So huge scramble uh, to get records online. And that was great. You know, it's uh, multi-user access and, you get, you know, you're getting discrete data elements versus, you know, uh, pieces of paper. So lots, lots of great things, but some bad things came of it too. And, um, and, and in all that, they decided from an efficiency perspective to hook up the medical devices. Makes perfect sense. Let's take the results of an infusion pump or the results of a patient monitoring system and feed them directly into the electronic record system. Makes perfect sense. So these devices that were never meant to be online, you put a network interface card in them and you made them work online, which is, again, great, but didn't think through the security piece. So now we've got the most valuable record in the world online um, with uh, connected to probably the most unsecured devices on the network. Uh, what could go wrong? So uh, in uh, 2015, the United States came out with a big cybersecurity act. In it was a whole call out section 405D for healthcare that said, um, we need to fix healthcare. We need to fix the cybersecurity aspects of healthcare. About the same time WannaCry happened where it shut down most of the UK and a UK health system on a self-propagating worm. Uh, so, I mean, healthcare systems were shut down and it was moving to the United States. The White House was actually in, you know, had convened uh, to, to figure out what they were going to do because the critical, their critical infrastructure was about to get hit. And um, luckily, uh, a gentleman by the name of Marcus, Marcus, hmm, his name escapes me, uh, 
figured out the back door, uh, Hutchins, Marcus Hutchins, figured to find the back door to that and, and turned off WannaCry. About a year later, he got uh, caught by the FBI selling malware. So the guys that wear in the white hats, they uh, they also own black hats. And uh, so it's it's a, it's a it's a crazy little world out there. But with all that, the U.S. government came back and said, we're going to do a report, an assessment called the Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity Report, or the HKIC. And then we need to figure out what the best practices are. So that's kind of started this whole journey of, of where why we have the problem and where we are. And what, what ended up uh, occurring is, you know, hacking has become a, a, a pretty big, big problem. Uh, this is a couple of years ago. I took some pictures uh, at Black Hat and, and DEF CON, which are the hackers conference. And one of the breakouts, uh, as far as a track, is the social engineering vi village where they show their skills and teach others in the room how to bypass physical security, how to make calls and convince people to give them information about their computer systems that will increase the probability of uh, penetrating their systems, learning how to pick a set of handcuffs. Good skill to have in this job, I think. Uh, I would say, if you're really good, you need to do that behind your back. And then a um, exhibitor area where they help get you started. But most disturbingly for me was the medical device hackathon breakout where they would buy old medical devices and hack into them and show how easy it was to hack into them. Just saying, you know, now today, this has kind of matured a little bit where you've got uh, the, the manufacturers actually participating. So they look at it like, I wanna know what my vulnerabilities are, which is actually, this is a true thing. The amount of disclosures has come a long way. People didn't used to wanna to even disclose that they had a vulnerability uh, for uh, fear of retribution. Now they're disclosing them uh, so they can get them fixed, but there is that lag of, we know there's a problem and it's not fixed. So, uh, and remember there's the Marcus Hutchins of the world out there, even though they, uh, they, 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 they own a white hat and a black hat. So healthcare is the number one target out of all industries. Bummer of a birthmark, Hal. Love that on my coffee cup when I was younger. Still makes sense to me today. Fools is a term that they use on the dark web to actually commoditize the value of a record. Not every record is worth the same. A record of a name and a credit card number may be worth 50 cents, where a medical record is worth up to of $1,000, between $500 and $1,000. Um, the healthcare industry, when hit, it, it hurts them the most. They lose uh, clients more than anybody else because you you can you can replace a credit card you can't replace your medical record once it's been breached and hacked and and altered the um number of breaches uh since 2020 continues to rise we'll get into a little statistics in a minute the uh, we don't invest very much in cybersecurity and healthcare and medical devices is patient safety all these patients that are hooked to medical devices um, whether it's just outcomes are affected. Ambulances are diverted. Um, length of stays are extended. All sorts of things. Uh, it doesn't have to be mortality, but often um, pe you know, people think it does impact mortality. So this problem, what's, it's why medical, medical devices? Well, medical devices are different. Uh, they are considered what's called operational technology uh, versus uh, IT, information technology. Information technology is like the servers and the laptops. OT is operational, like medical devices or building management systems or IoT. We call it XIoT for the extended Internet of Things. But all of these extended Internet of Things, uh, they're they're different. And they're different for all these reasons, really, the a lot of regulatory guidelines specifically for them, but the communications protocols, they don't talk in TCP IP over the network. They talk in unique protocols. So you can't use traditional security tools to listen to them or, or query them or determine what device it is on the network. Those tools don't work because 
those 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 IT security tools are looking for IT specific protocol communications like TCP IP or HL7 or DICOM, where the medical devices and building management systems, they talk in Greek and um, Italian or whatever, right? Just some obscure language. Not that Italian's obscure. But um, they're also critical to patient care. Uh, people like to hack them just so that they can uh, use them as part of a, uh, a botnet or to mine Bitcoin, get the processing power out of them. There's 14 devices per bed. We, we say on an average five just to keep it low, but it's between five and 14, which creates a, a very, very large problem. And um, creates a very large problem. And uh, we, we, there's scanning limitations, so we can't actually uh, scan the devices. Remote access, while it's good in the fact that you can access it for, uh, for purposes of manufacturing, uh, supporting their devices, you can't uh, say that's a good thing uh, if, if uh, hackers are using it to access the devices. Then it doesn't support antivirus because they're, they're not scaled for additional memory. Uh, it, it, they're, they're tough to uh, remediate uh, or create mitigations for. And by the time they get past FAA and getting approved, they're five years old and the operating systems are outdated. And so they become legacy devices quickly. So it's just a lot there, but there's just a whole lot of reasons that OT devices can't be managed the same as IT devices. And when you get into uh, just breach statistics, you know, I say that 98.27348% of all statistics are made up anyway, but if you look at a moment in an aggregate, all the numbers are going in the wrong direction. So I tend to, to believe that when it's all correlated together, uh, whether it's the number of records or the number of breaches or the number of hospitals or the costs, or um, it's just all not good. And we're finding that the, the hackers are moving away from simply social engineering through emails and actually uh, hacking into application servers and um, window servers and, 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 and things like that. A recent study showed that the root cause of the data breach as according to um, 600, five to 600 uh, hospitals said that it was the IOT device or a medical device that had actually was the, the entry point for the, uh, the attack. And here, what's the consequence of the cyber attacks on patient care, which is, you know, 70% length of stay, 69% delay in, in procedures, 63% uh, diverted to other, uh, other, other uh, facilities. Uh, we saw that in, in Germany, where the uh, University of Dusseldorf was hacked, and it ended up hitting the, the, uh, uh, um, the hospital. A patient got diverted and died in transit. So, but you know, affecting the mortality rate is you know 23%. I, I just find that to be you know disturbing. Uh, CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency here did a did a study and found a correlation between ransomware and uh, and the strain it puts on hospitals. And, and I think the general consensus is when you take away technology that's supporting 15 patients uh, with, and you still have the same number of patients, but uh, less technology, you can't serve them as well. And therefore, outcomes is, is going to be negatively impacted. So a wicked problem. What is, what is a wicked problem? A wicked problem is um, a problem so complicated that it's tough to even wrap your mind around it. What it, the breadth and the depth, not to mention trying to come up with a solution, and it affects people's lives. So that's that's just a you know I think that's a, a, an apt description on a wicked problem, and uh, I got that from Bruce Shiner uh, from a book he wrote called "Click Here to Kill Everyone." Uh, he talks about having bio three D bio printers. 
uh, that could potentially be hacked and print a virus and do that across a region and then buy some um, some put or some some puts uh, on the on the, the stock market so that when the stock market drops, you know, you make money. It's just crazy stuff like that. I think I saw that in a James Bond episode, um, Casino Royale, something like that. But, you know, so it's it's uh, it, it's not it's not crazy that, that people might try this. And so it becomes a wicked problem. And so I'll stop there. Just kind of that's kind of a high level before this, you know, setting the where we've been, what the issues are, what this big problem is before you start moving into some solutions and just find out whether or not you have uh, the audience has just been thoroughly entertained and not typing in any questions. And uh, or if you if you've got a couple of questions out there, maybe we could we could answer some. Absolutely. So I don't see any questions uh, in the chat just yet. I think people are quite interested in um, uh, in noting, uh, just kind of tracking your discussion. I do see some in the chat, which I'll highlight. But before I get to that, I want to call out something that you just said. The 12% attacks on IoT devices as a source, but a full 9% um, were attacks on medical devices. So I think you can see why... <clears throat> Uh, given the length of time between our capital equipment refreshes of medical devices, which is about 10 years, versus the three-year evergreening cycle for IT devices, you can see why we want to do our part in making uh, medical devices more secure. So I'm really happy that you're actually talking with us. I know a lot of these seem kind of, um, are they real, are they not? Uh, it, it's so futuristic, but the future is here. Like it's it's a scary world. So I'm really happy that you're you're discussing with us today. Um, there was uh, one question, which is, can you kindly send a link to the type of protection devices that are available? Thanks. So maybe um, if we want to take care of that afterwards, maybe you and I and Adil can take care of that. And Jack mentioned that the sound is a little bit low. If you could speak up just a smidge. Sure. Happy happy to speak up. Um, and uh, I'll just say that uh, we're. Uh, there's a, a new document coming out um, on legacy medical devices called HICMALT, kind of a crazy to H-I-C-M-A-L-T-S through the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council. And it's all about legacy devices, uh, the uh, healthcare industry, cybersecurity, med tech, um, med tech, oh, legacy technology or something. I don't know. Um, but it's, uh, it's really, it's about 120 pages of what do you do? to cyber secure legacy medical devices. Basically, you know, they've, they've been out there longer than their operating systems and there's, there's nobody's gonna patch them anymore. What do you do with these? And so that's gonna be coming out. You might wanna look for that at the Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council um, website if you're looking for uh, references. There's, uh, they've got some other great documents there, one on model contracting language for cybersecurity. Um, and uh, also you could find this, uh, this document we'll be talking about in a minute uh, called Hiccup or Health Industry Cybersecurity Practices. So the Healthcare Industry, Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council, you should be able to find it. So with the, um, just kind of moving on, the, uh, so the hospital itself, it's really not just medical devices. You can see there's medical devices, but there's so many other devices that could compromise a, uh, uh, a hospital that are connected to the the networks. One of the problems is they took the they used to have the OT networks separated from the IT networks, but they found that wow, let's go ahead and make one backbone and save money. And so now you can cross over on the same network if you come in the elevator or the HVAC unit. Uh, you can actually, if you're not just trying to shut it down, you can get over into the uh, medical side and get into the EMR uh, if that was your, you know, if you wanted to encrypt it in, in, in ransomware. So I put in some medical, what are some medical devices? Here are some medical devices. There's, you know, premise-based and there's remote-based and really all of these are, are connected to the network, whether it's um, wirelessly or, you know, through a RS-232 or, uh, you know, just, just di different ways to connect, but they end up being connected. But again, to call out the building management systems, a lot of people don't think about these and the impacts that they can have 
Uh, one one um, group did a uh, scenario where they set it up in Arizona and in the summertime, and they simulated the air, uh, the uh, air conditioning going down and the elevators shutting down and the EMR shutting down at the same time. And they went into emergency triage immediately. You know, you're not going to live. You're not going to live. It's so there's the functions in a hospital, the mechanics, uh, if you, shutting down the air handling systems for surgery. Uh, all of a sudden you can't do surgery. There's just so many different areas and ways that these things, if I can think about them, the bad guys have already thought about them. And then the different types of devices that are out there, different devices, there's different infusion pumps, highest volume out there, much higher than an imaging system. Uh, so is it the number of devices that make the uh, increased attack surface? Um, or is it the number of vulnerabilities on an imaging system that are uh, is, a, is, a, is a worse attack surface? You know, it kind of depends. And so figuring out based on device what the criticalities are, what the vulnerabilities are, all pretty complicated stuff, part of the wicked problem. So Gartner has come out with a way to just kind of let everybody know where they are uh, or where, where, you know, each each organization is and that there are clearly different um, paths or different um, stages and these different device types are are at different stages in this cyber physical system where at the bottom you see this the the six stages of awareness which is basically maybe that's where you are today there's a difference between it and ot well, you'd be with the 60% that didn't really understand that until today. And now that you understand that there's a problem and there's a difference and things need to be managed differently, you put in a product like Medigate. And the, the, the way we, we go in and we look at, we're able to find all the OT devices, whereas the traditional security tools can't. We're just designed differently. We're, we're, that's why we built our solution. And so we find all these devices and that's great until you realize, oh my gosh, look at all these devices we have that are unmanaged. We're not doing anything with them. And then it's firefighting, whereas we, now we have to do something about, we got, got to do something about these vulnerabilities. Which ones do we do first? Which ones have the most criticality? What are the best mitigations? What are the best solutions? What do the manufacturers recommend? Firefighting. And then integrate that because you can integrate that data into your existing IT security stack. So it's not like you got to get a whole other stack. For it's like the Cisco's and the CrowdStrikes and the ServiceNow's and the uh, Rapid Sevens and the uh, Splunk. All these different tools out there. All this data can go there and be operationalized. Uh, and then you know tuning on optimize optimization, but building management systems. They're just figuring that out, that cybersecurity is an issue that they have to be involved with. It's not just an IT problem. So with every problem is an opportunity. So my Tony Robbins, let's get my Tony Robbins mode now, right? Um, and, you know, well, first I'll say, you know, bringing together different departments that have never worked together before on a single database to solve a new problem with uh, changing processes and learning new technology, new ways of doing things, new paradigms of thinking. That's, there gonna be new job opportunities, uh, new opportunities for education, uh, new opportunities for employment. Um, challenges at your workspace, rewarding opportunities. I mean, oh, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, and I think a lot of people in healthcare are are here to help. And so here's a here's a way that you can help by by shoring up all of those entry points that hackers can come in and negatively impact um, 
the quality of patient care that we all, you know, that's going to be for your grandmother and your children and you, just like me. I mean, we're, we're all in the same boat. So what's, what's kind of going on there? So we've got um, some, some, some new activity here. Uh, this is by Senator Warner. He, he's, he's out there kind of kicking tires and saying, what can we do? He's got a good feel for everything. Uh, but he, before he, you know, measure twice, cut once, he, he put a, a document out that said, I want to know what you think about these areas. So these are the areas that are in, in discussion, modernizing HIPAA. You know, how are we looking at security and privacy? Kind of old school when we're going off the of 1990s regulation. The Stark Law, meaning anti-kickback. Big hospitals can't give little hospitals help and technology because then the little hospitals will probably send their business to the big hospitals, and that's a kickback, and that's uh, antitrust. So we're, we're looking at those, too, because we need to help each other. The workforce development. I mean, it kind of speaks for itself. We don't have enough people. These are net new jobs, new technologies. We need to develop that workforce and, uh, and uh, reward them. From an incentives and requirements, what are the basic minimums? Is there a basic minimum? Is that the best way to go? Should we just have a checklist? Or should it be outcomes-based, performance-based measures? Uh, all the insecure legacy systems out, that are out there, because you know just as well as I, you got, you know, you're just saying it's a 10 year. Michael was saying it's a 10 years on the on the devices, at least. It, I mean, that's what the like, that's what the clinical engineering systems do. The uh, 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 engineers do they they keep those things working forever, sometimes 15, 20 years, right? I mean, it's when you think about a um, a um, an X ray machine, uh, is is the X ray that's coming out uh, that much better? that you're going to be able to validate the, the, the increased cost of replacement or is the x-ray system that we have, as long as we keep it working, working just fine. Of course, it's not secure and can be hacked, but it's working just fine. It, you know, it doesn't justify the, the upgrade and the, the cost, especially a lot of the medical devices. Um, the, the, it's, it's, a it's a difficult business case. And then the SBOM, which is the software bill of materials, kind of what's, it's like the ingredients inside the medical device, because that can be hacked too. The firmware, the uh, open source code, the off the, uh, off the shelf uh, code, it's, it's all of that inside can also be hacked. And so uh, there's, a, there's a push that says, we should be sharing that information from the medical device manufacturer. Now, the third one there is recovery. You know, should there be a, a safe harbor with security measures? If you're doing certain security measures, you know, you're not going to get in trouble uh, with, with, the, uh, with the government or the, the regulatory agencies. Uh, and also cyber insurance. Cyber insurance is, is going away. The money's drying up. They're losing their, their shirts and they're going to start requiring, or I believe, start requiring uh, the, uh, their clients to show a minimum of uh, cybersecurity measures if they want to get insurance. So again, this, doc, this was one document he put out asking all these questions and starting the dialogue around all of this. Uh, the Joint Commission, Michael, you had mentioned this. This is the accreditation organization for the government and for hospitals, one of them. And they've decided that uh, they've done such a poor job in the past of cybersecurity for connected medical devices. They have started a, a group, a, 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 um, a new team to audit hospitals on this particular uh, case. Uh, so that's coming. And that's got a lot of uh, hospitals motivated because if they don't um, meet these audits, their, their reimbursement dollars from Medicare and Medicaid uh, will be penalized. So the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services got together by directive of the Cybersecurity Act of 2015 and that report we talked about and were tasked with creating the healthcare industry cybersecurity practices and what have now been called the recognized security practices. And the, was broke, that was broken down into five top threats to the healthcare industry. Email phishing, 
And we're all familiar with that. Ransomware, absolutely big problem growing every year. Uh, loss or theft of equipment and data. And you know that one uh, with, with, with the uh, requirement on encryption, uh, really the uh, penalties have gone down because once they, they, they get the equipment, um, oftentimes they can't get to it because uh, we're getting better at encrypting those devices. And um, accidental or intentional data loss. So those are the you know four. But the fifth one is medical devices. I mean, called out specifically. So it's it, they we we can't be talking about this loudly enough. Yet uh, it, it really hasn't um, uh, met, metamorphosized into a you know more of a active engagement on the the part of the healthcare community to do something about it. Um, so this, hence all this, this activity around it from a regulatory perspective. The uh, 10 mitigations that we came up with uh, each have sub practices. So these are just kind of a high level, but again, medical device security or OT for OT devices is called out because it needs to be done differently. And here's a matrix of all the practices, which are those 10 across the top. Uh, email protection, endpoint, access management. But then over on the right, medical device security, uh, those are the sub practices. And they're, they're broken up for small, medium, and large. And uh, if you wanted to uh, find this, you could go on the uh, website 405d.hhs.gov. That's 405d.hhs.gov. And um, pulled these documents down a lot of detail in there, but you can see that you've got these categories of endpoint protection, asset management, network management policies. Uh, all of these are sub practices and tells you how to do this for medical OT devices versus an IT device. So we're not going to go into a ton of detail through all of these slides, uh, but just to call out, these are the best practices for, for medical devices is get a computerized maintenance management system, which is basically the, a record, uh, a database for all of the information as it relates to any medical device. And it's maintenance, it's security information, patches, uh, you know, is at least just every, everything about it. Um, and then utilize an asset discovery and security tool like ours so that you can process all this information and all the vulnerabilities and just, uh, well, and protect the devices. It needs to be automated because you've got tens of thousands of devices you need to do this to. So if you think about the old vulnerability management scanning tools for like an IT device, like a Rapid7 or a Tenable, you scan devices, but when you scan a medical device, you know, you might get a MAC address and an IP, IP address and a manufacturer, but that's about it. That's not really helpful. With our tool, we do what's called deep packet inspection. It's a passive scan. We're not touching the device. We're reading the network traffic. And we have learned how to speak in Greek and Italian and uh, Russian and Latin and all these other languages so that synonymous to the medical device manufacturers communications protocols, we go in and we can see all this data now. And this is this changes the world for OT device management. Now having all of this data, you know where the device is, whether it has PHI on it, whether it's encrypted, what VLAN it's in, what's vulnerable to, you know, it's what the IP address is, what software versions are in it. And when you throw in the SBOM in this, we know the ingredients inside all these devices too. So it's a, it's a game changer, this technology. This is why we're best in class, which is a, uh, a healthcare rating uh, uh, last two years, hoping this year too. Um, but it's, it's, I would say it's this right here because this allows us to tell what the device is without a doubt. Uh, others out there are kind of guessing with machine learning and AI based on its behavior. We know because we're reading the packets of information. And I will tell you that 
step one, whether it's in the NIST cybersecurity framework or CIS SANS top 20 or whatever framework, it all starts with what's your software inventory? What's your hardware inventory? If you don't know that, it doesn't really matter what you do. You're not going to have a comprehensive solution. How do you know what to protect? What do you know what vulnerabilities you have if you don't even know what the device model make operating systems are on these things, right? So visibility, key number one, hands down. Um, and that's, that's why we've been so successful. Uh, so kind of starting from the beginning, uh, procurement and security. Well, start pushing this out to your procurement, because if you can do risk assessments using these type of tools, you can then stop bringing on new risk, which will then allow you to bail water out of your sinking boat. But if you're just bailing water without plugging the hole, you know, you got to stop, you got to stop the, the, the risk from coming in. And so you do that through understanding what's in the device with the SBOM, the MDS-2, which is the manufacturer's disclosure statement for medical device security. We import those. And so we know, again, what, what, what the, the, the risks are to the device so that you understand the full risk you're bringing out. You might decide to accept it, but then as a part of the onboarding process, you can put in the mitigations required to prevent that device from being risky uh, before it hits the network. Endpoint protection. Uh, say like for a crowd strike, it's a great tool, but you need to put an agent or software on the device. Medical devices, for the most part, don't support that. They don't have the memory. They were never designed to have some other software loaded on it. So endpoint protection doesn't really work. But what we can do is we can send, um, we can look at the devices and see whether or not there is an endpoint. And, and, and it support and it maybe supports it. There's 20% that don't have endpoints that, that may support it. We send that, say, over the crowd strike, and they can then go and um, increase the coverage and reduce the attack surface. Also, um, they send us the patch levels because they can see that. They send us the patch levels of the devices, and now we factor that in to our vulnerability management, you know, is the device vulnerable or not? I don't know, what's the patch level? Well, now we know what the patch level is and whether the device is vulnerable. So there's ways that you can work with these solutions um, that, that wouldn't be able to operate on medical devices without us. Network management and identity access, another one. We baseline all the devices. And again, you can think of this in general. When I say we, there's other, tech, there's other, uh, other companies out there in our industry. So we're not the only ones who do this. Uh, just you know, being being very fair, I just think that we do it the best. So if you're going to if you're going to do any evaluations, please include us. Um, and the network management piece here is the ability to baseline all the devices' activity and communications. So we know that these hundred infusion pumps, they all talk to these five things on the network and the internet. Great, lock them down. Only let those infusion pumps talk to those five things. And if we see one of them talking to something else. That's going to be a problem, but we can take that that um, network communications restrictions and say send that over to Cisco and have them build that into their network communication restrictions. So now we've locked those hundred infusion pumps down. Even if they get hacked, they're not talking to anybody but what they should talk to. They can't use it as a point of lateral movement. So network management. To, to understand the device, what it is, what the communications is, requires a tool like ours uh, if you're going to apply it to OT devices. Vulnerability management, same thing. We talked about not IT device, oh, IT based vulnerability management systems not being able to scan medical devices because it's very aggressive. They go in and say, for like when you put your laptop on a network, it says, you need to upgrade your um, whatever, you know, your, your software. And then you, you go ahead and do it. The reason it knows that is it's talking to your device. It's, it's querying your device. Medical devices aren't designed for that. So if you tried to query it like that, it might turn it off. And if that's attached to somebody, uh, some medical device, an infusion pump or what have you, that's a bad thing. 
Uh, so they don't they they don't scan them and 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 so there's a lot of devices out there that are just sitting on the network. They just let them on because I can't restrict medical devices from coming on the network or what they can do, and I can't query them. I, I can't scan them with our technology. You uh, you can do what the, the passive scanning and understand uh, a lot more about that device and what the risks are and. <clears throat> then integrate it back in with say a rapid seven or a, a, a tenable by saying, hey, here are the medical devices. These are the ones you can't scan. You can scan everything else. So it increases the, the, uh, the applicability of the existing tools that you have and better coverage. And all the alerts, you wanna send them over to a, a security operations center um, and you wanna reduce the number of false positives. So you don't want just every vulnerability or every potential security alert being sent over to a, um, I mean, how would you like that job? Just filtering now, that's not, you know, you end up with uh, uh, alert fatigue is what it, it, uh, it boils down to. So those are some of the high level, no matter what country you live in, you know, the devices, the hackers, the networks, the tools, those are, those are the things that are the best practices. So much so, that the uh, uh, the U.S. government said, if you'll do them, these recognized security practices for 12 months, and you have a breach, we won't find. We will give you consideration in not fining you, no fees or no post-breach oversight. It's like you tried. You're doing what we're asking. Uh, if you just do these recognized security practices, the only two they mentioned was NIST and this 405D, the stuff that we just reviewed. So, and again, you can find that at 405d.hhs.gov. Very recently, the um, Consolidated Appropriations Act, this is in December. I mean, this is all like wicked current, right? The FDA uh, was, and the CISA were, were granted uh, basically some teeth. And it's for creating, um, a uh, incentive, incentivizing through the FDA and its oversight, uh, medical device manufacturers' interest in improving the uh, identification and monitoring of vulnerabilities of their medical devices, coordinating those vulnerability disclosures with uh, healthcare organizations, figuring out a better and faster way to do updates and patches and create a software bill of materials. What's in my devices that's vulnerable? And so that SBOM kind of looks maybe something like this. You've got um, Carol's compression engine and the bingo buffer version 2.2 and all these things are kind of com combined into this Acme application. And now we will know We'll, the manufacturers will provide this breakdown to hospitals, but kind of what is that going to do for you where it, that, that's really also going to require something called a VEX. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of data here or information, but think about it as the ability to say, okay, in, those, in that SBOM, the components in the SBOM, which ones are affected and which ones aren't? Because we talked about earlier with the, the SOC not being, not wanting to, kill people with uh, um, overload of false positives, you only wanna send them stuff that's affected. And this kind of helps out determining what components really need to be, which are, are affected. But still, it's still a lot of noise until you decide we're gonna import that into a tool like Metagate. This, is, this, is, this would be a, a diagram of how Metagate looks and how it works with those aligns with those cybersecurity practices we just went through. We're built, you know, it's, it's, it's funny to see that you, you, we're, 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 we built ourselves in a way that really turned out to be best practices. And so it's no, it's no surprise to us that 250 experts across the United States came out with, or actually the world came out with, these are the best, these are the best things you can do. And it's, and it's what we're doing to improve cyber resilience and operational resilience because when a new threat comes in your, your environment, you need to pivot and you need to pivot quickly. You need to 
figure out what your baselines are, figure out what the vulnerabilities are, the risks, which ones are critical, send that information off to a, uh, a, a system of a, a, that, that does work orders like ServiceNow, which we are now fully aligned with to send out the work orders to the devices, to the field agents to say, go fix this now, whether it's a, it's a security engineer or it's, a, it's a, um, a, a, a network engineer or it's a clinical engineer, whoever it needs to go to, that you're operationalizing all of this data. Uh, and so really this, this would be a, a nice diagram of, of how the overall, if you had to architect the, what, this, what these suggestions of uh, the HHS are. And kind of from an unexpected business value perspective, now that we have all of this data because of our deep packet inspection, we can do utilization in a way that's never been done before across manufacturers. Sure, if you got a bunch of GE devices, maybe GE can tell you about their devices, but they can't tell you about Siemens. So here across all devices, we're able to improve from a soft dollar quali quali qualitative perspective you know, we can find devices faster because we know where they are, uh, uh, um, exactly where they are. We know which risks are, um, are, are most critical, which vulnerabilities are real, uh, reconciling this with your CMMS. All these things are, these are labor efficiencies, which are great, but not going to uh, make anybody, you know, run out and buy anything immediately. But Here's a healthcare uh, institution that reduced their inventory by 10% because they knew that they didn't need all the devices that they had because they could see the utilization rates. Another hospital said, why do we have 24 hour response time on these devices? We've got enough of them and you can see the utilization is low uh, or low enough that we could survive with 72 hour, millions of dollars in contracts savings that this organization found. This hospital had three CTs, the health system decided, well, let's move one of those CTs instead of buying one over to another state and share it. So, or or even load balancing uh, within the organ within the within that uh, um, institution. So you're not overloading one and jacking up the maintenance cost by by driving it into the ground. So there's you know these are these are real world real dollar uh, ways that you can take this new data that you never had before and operationalize it into capital planning. So kind of kind of with that, uh, I'll just summarize it by saying that, you know, whether it's immediate, we're, like we are in the white hot throes of, of it all right now here in the United States. The White House is about to come out with something new this month. And the regulatory agencies are pushing hard to solve this problem. And if the industry can't solve it ourselves, they're going to help us solve it. The High Tech Act is out there creating an incentive for the healthcare industry cybersecurity practices to say, come on, guys, here's some best practices. Try to put these in place and, 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 and we'll go light on you if you have a breach. The uh, accreditation organizations, they're, they're, they're coming and I can, uh, you know, that they're they're going to get the uh, at least the um, the interest of the uh, executives within uh, the U.S. The SBOM will be worldwide, and what is your organization's ability to digest that, import it, and turn it from noise into signal? How are you going to operationalize that data and not just have a bunch of spreadsheets from different manufacturers? Um, and I would say that the oper operationalization of, uh, of the, the security data we talked about, say, whether you're sending out work orders for onboarding or for uh, um, a clinical engineer to touch a device or network engineering to uh, put in some new network segmentation or a security engineer to change a password or turn a port off and have the instructions on how to do that in the work order. And, and then one of the things I think has been largely holding everybody back is we just don't have the money. It's a crisis out there. Well, once you realize that you can actually, if you've got tens or hundreds of millions of dollars in assets and you are not utilizing them efficiently, there's a lot of margin for savings and increased revenue that you're not realizing and it's only because you don't have the data. And 
Nobody has. Nobody's had the data until now. So again, a lot of opportunity, and um, I I hope that this is this has helped kind of expand uh, the, the the issues that are out there, why we're here, and the opportunities uh, that are that are out there for you to help solve the problem in your area. That was great. Thank you, Ty. Um, such a fascinating talk on such a burgeoning, um, very scary <laughs> uh, subject, but I'm really glad that we can uh, take a look at it in several different ways. Uh, a couple of things I want to call out that, that you uh, really sp sparked. Um, so for instance, with your passive scanning for vulnerability management, and you're doing more uh, than the traditional oh, let's run virus scan thing, you're doing actually deep packet inspection, so it's a little bit safer. Um, and the various types of contexts, what I really like that you did is you kind of confirmed for us that mitigate or a couple of the different uh, versions that are out there. Um, it's more than just medical grade VPN. Like there's, there's actually a lot more function functionality that's there, both from the cybersecurity perspective, as well as the overall medical device OT, um, IOT. So that I think, I think I suspect if others are like me uh, who are watching, um, that gives a lot of pause and a lot of takeaways to kind of think about it. So mm -hmm. in that, and we have a number of questions, which given there are only five, like three minutes left, I don't think we're going to quite get to. So if you're amenable, what we typically do is we'll, uh, we'll send you the questions written and then we'll send that out to the folks who registered uh, for the talk just to get all of the good questions uh, addressed, if, if that's okay. Um, only but, only, uh, only if, if, if when I'm in town, if next time I'm in... Uh... Uh, St. John's, somebody's going to buy me some fish and chips. Um, and uh... I'm in Halifax, but deal. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely deal. Um, I have this question for you, because I think this is, a, I, I suspect this is also on people's minds, because especially what you hit on, because you hit on straight uh, security aspects, networking aspects, but you also hit on the de medical device management question. So do you see a product such as yours? Um, is it uh, Biomed or IT or jointly Biomed plus IT who hosts and manages and operates that system for network moderation? What do you think? Yeah, that's that's a, that's a great question. And it, um, you know, better the answer you hate is it depends. Because um, the one thing I would say, if, there's, if you've seen one healthcare organization, you've seen one because they're all different. And it just depends on, you know, some people work together great, some people don't, some people, um, you know, have, have uh, are, are siloed, some aren't. Uh, so I, I, would, I would say that probably best to have the information system, uh, information security kind of own it, um, but IT procurement and clinical engineering, uh, they, they all have to have a seat at the table um, I would even throw uh, compliance in there here, but mm. but it, you know who 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 ultimately owns it depends. I like the coalition ownership, frankly. I, I in Canada we would actually um, possibly uh, others would agree throw in risk management with yeah, that uh, yeah, multidisciplinary yeah. Uh, approach. Um, we have a lot of uh, questions that are that are listed here that are fairly. Um, uh, complex or a lot of pieces to it, but there's one in particular, I think in the two minutes that we have left, uh, asking, can you mention if there's progress to the patch act? So the patch, that's a good question. So the patch act, um, it almost passed. It, uh, it passed the house, didn't pass the Senate, probably due to the lobbyists um, for the medical device manufacturers, because it was going to put the onus on them to provide better patching and updating in an SBOM and lifecycle management, uh, which is a cost to them. And um, it's uh, changes their, you know, the uh, increased responsibility. And also they're gonna end up sharing kind of the uh, open their kimono and show what's in their products. And so th there's a reluctance there, although a willingness to want to fix the problem. Um, and so I, you know, I think they were fighting it. Uh, somebody was, and the, uh, consolidation act that I, I discussed 
uh, in the omnibus bill that just got passed in December had a portion of the Patch Act. So it was kind of a scaled down, watered down version of the Patch Act. And so a lot of the things that were in the Patch Act just got uh, processed. Now the FDA was uh, allocated $5 million to oversee this, hire some people to increase cybersecurity. They were given teeth to what's called a prohibitive act. If there's any prohibitive acts, they've got teeth to discipline medical device manufacturers. It will probably be for legacy devices and uh, new devices, and it will affect updates, patches, and require an SBOM. So it's a lot of what was in the Patch Act just got passed. Excellent, thank you. Hopefully that answers the question for Steve Clark, who posed that question. Um, with that, uh, I think given we're at the hour and actually two minutes past it, um, I would encourage folks to uh, email uh, a deal or I uh, questions that they have so that we could pass them along to Ty. And um, just being respectful of everyone's time. Um, uh, a deal, I think I'll turn it back to you for some closing remarks. Yep, perfect, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, thank you, Ty, again. Uh, this was fantastic. I, I mean, we could have talked about this and let, you know, the the shortage of time is always a problem. Uh, and so a topic like this, I mean, you can go on for hours and pick your brain about so many things, but hopefully we can have you on again, uh, chatting and maybe more of a Q&A session. Maybe, you know, we'll, we'll look into something like that. Uh, for everyone on, on the call, uh, thank you so much. Uh, again, we'll have this posted on YouTube, uh, have your questions also answered, hopefully by Ty as well, as long as he gets his vision chips and, and a beer, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, for, for our next couple of webinars, will be uh, there's gonna be the CISO conference for everybody. And then we'll also have a right to repair uh, coming up in February. Um, and with that, thank you so much. Enjoy your Monday and we will see you guys next time. Thank you again. Bye-bye everybody. Thank you.